All right. So Israel, Iran, it's really heating up over there. And this article from The Economic Times, well, it really digs into like all the possibilities. I mean, everything from, you know, diplomacy to, uh, well, military action. Yeah, the timing of this whole thing, it's kind of what grabbed me. You realize this was published October 10th. Right. And the article says that was the same day Israel was like supposed to figure out what their response was going to be to those missile attacks. It's like, we're not just talking hip here. It's happening right now. Yeah. Like yeah. reading a spy novel, except it's, you know, the front page. Yeah. And the stakes are huge. One thing the article really brings up is how much disagreement there is. Like even allies, the U.S. and Israel, they can't even agree on what a proportional response would be to those attacks. Exactly. And that's where it gets really interesting. Yeah. You've got the U.S. with an election just weeks away, and they are not happy about Israel even thinking about hitting those nuclear facilities or the oil. And it's not just about, you know, this one conflict. You disrupt Iran's oil, especially this close to the U.S. election. Think about what that does to oil prices. Voters care about that stuff. Not to mention Biden. He actually called Israel a rogue state. <laughs> not exactly sending a Hallmark card there. No. Definitely not. And that's the U.S. president. Right. Yeah. I mean, that kind of language coming from the White House, that tells you something about how bad things are between them right now. I mean, you got to look back at their history. It hasn't always been smooth sailing, uh -huh. especially when you bring in the whole Palestinian issue. But Biden saying something like that, it's more than just disagreeing on policy. They are really worried about what Israel might do. They got burned with that whole thing in Lebanon, remember? Felt like they got blindsided. Now they're like, one's bitten, twice shy. OK, so pressure cooker situation, allies not getting along. And then the article mentions that Israel might actually be considering a strike, like a real attempt to take out Iran's nuclear program. Is that even possible? Could they actually pull it off? That's the big question. And honestly, nobody really knows. The article mentions that even some of their own people, Israeli officials, they're not sure they could really do enough damage. Mm -hmm. And these aren't like shacks in the desert. We're talking buried, fortified, the whole nine yards, not an easy target. But here's the thing. The article says that U.S. officials are worried that Israel might try it anyway, which is kind of wild if you think about it. If their own experts aren't even sure, why would Israel risk it? Urgency. Some people over there, they really think this might be their only shot at stopping Iran from getting nukes, you know? <laughs> right or wrong, that's the thinking. Nobody can agree what the best move is, but they know they got to do something. So let's say Israel does retaliate. What are we even talking about here? What are their options? The article lists a few possibilities. Military bases, obviously. Intelligence places is even going after their oil. Oh, and this is interesting. It mentions hitting something called leadership sites, yeah. <laughs> which honestly, that's pretty creepy when you think about it. Okay, let's break that down. So military and intelligence targets. Logistically, how does Israel even pull that off? Oh, it's a nightmare. We're talking over a thousand miles just to get there. Mid-air refueling, maybe over countries that aren't exactly fans of Israel. And then, of course, you've got Iran's air defenses. And those aren't like toys, those are Russian-made, top yeah. of the line. It would be incredibly risky. And then there's upsetting the neighbors. The article specifically mentions Jordan, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. And that's just from flying over and never mind, you know, actually launching attacks from their territory. Yeah, diplomatically, it could be a disaster. Some of those countries have been, like, making nice with Iran recently, right? <laughs> yeah. Israel launches attacks. They can easily push those countries right back into Iran's arms. The Middle East, it's like a giant game of risk, but with real consequences. And then there's the oil. If Israel hits Iran's oil, I mean, we talked about it with the U.S. election, but globally, that's got to be a nightmare. Colon chaos. Iran, they're a major oil producer. You disrupt that, prices would go through the roof. The global economy would be a mess. And for Biden, with the election so close, talk about bad timing. It's like everything's connected, right? One move sets off this chain reaction, and who knows where it ends. And and we haven't even mentioned the biggest what if. What if Iran retaliates? That's the question, isn't it? Because they've already said this is bigger than just Israel, right? I mean, they could easily go after U.S. troops, U.S. allies in the region. It could be a regional war. It really could. Nobody knows how it would play out. That's what makes this whole thing so terrifying. Our risk is unbelievable. But here's the craziest part. Even with all of this hanging over their heads, even with the possibility of a wider war, the article says there's no agreement on what to do. And and get this, even former leaders of Israel are split on the best course of action. I know, right. It's like they're on a reality show. Former prime ministers of Israel. Who has the best plan? Except in this case, 
It's not a game. Yeah, and these aren't just any former leaders. Ehud Olmert, Yer Lapid, Naftali Bennett. These guys have been in the hot seat, and they each have very different takes on how to deal with Iran. Okay, so let's dive into that. Let's start with Olmert. What's his take? He's definitely team cautious. <laughs> He's basically saying, don't touch the oil, don't touch the nuclear stuff. He's worried about making things a million times worse. I mean, can you blame him? But then there's Lapid, right? He's got a different idea. He's all about hitting the oil. He says that's how you really hurt them economically. But here's the thing. Even he says if they're going after the nuclear stuff, the U.S. has to be involved, which, come on, after everything we just talked about, not likely. So we've got cautious, we've got hit him where it hurts, and then... Then there's Bennett. Oh, yeah. Bennett's taking a totally different approach. He's like, hold my beer. Pretty much. He's saying, go big or go home. Hit everything while they have the chance, while Iran's still trying to figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. Pretty gutsy. Some might even say reckless. So to recap, you've got three former prime ministers, all brilliant guys, and they're looking at the same situation, and they've got three totally different solutions. It really makes you think, doesn't it? Yeah. There are no easy answers here. It's mind-blowing. And all of this was happening, like, as this article was going to print. Talk about a cliffhanger. Seriously. But it also makes you wonder, is there any way out of this? Can they actually solve this peacefully? That's the million-dollar question. <laughs> and that's what we'll be talking about in our next deep dive. So we've talked a lot about, like, the military stuff, but is there even a chance this could all get worked out peacefully? Or is it too late for that? Well, that's the big question now, isn't it? You're right. The article is mostly about military options. But, I mean, there are always people working behind the scenes mm. trying to talk things down. For his question is, can it actually work? I mean, both sides seem pretty dug in. What are the chances they actually sit down and, you know, hash things out? It's going to be tough. That's for sure. They don't exactly trust each other. And there's like decades of bad blood to get past. But on the other hand, nobody really wants a war. Right. Yeah. Especially one that could drag in the whole region. And don't forget the economic side of things. War would be a disaster for both of them, not to mention what it would do to, like, the global economy. OK, so let's say just for a second that they do try to work things out. What would that even look like? What kind of compromises would they have to make? Well, any real agreement, it would have to address the things that have been driving this conflict forever. Right. So you're talking about Iran's nuclear program, those missiles they're building, and the fact that they support all those other groups in the region. I mean, that's asking a lot. Is there any sign that Iran's even willing to talk about that stuff? That's the problem. <laughs> Iran has always said their nuclear stuff is peaceful, right? And they say they need the missiles for their own defense. So yeah, getting them to budge on any of that, it would take a lot. Maybe some serious sanctions relief or some kind of security guarantees. And what about Israel? What would they have to be okay with to make a deal? For them, it's all about feeling safe. They need to know Iran won't get nukes and that those missiles aren't going to be used against them. So probably that means some way to keep tabs on Iran's nuclear program, maybe even limits on those missiles. So both sides want a lot. Is there even any middle ground here? That's what the diplomats are trying to figure out, right? Yeah. It would take like some serious creativity, finding something that both sides can stomach even if it's not everything they want. That sounds crazy complicated. And with all the other stuff we talked about, the military options, the possibility of things getting out of control, even those disagreements within Israel, I mean, it's hard to imagine them actually pulling off a negotiated peace. You're telling me it's a long shot for sure? I mean, look at the track record. Broken promises, failed negotiations, the whole deal. But here's the thing. A real war. Nobody wants to go there. The consequences are just too awful to think about. So while everyone's waiting for Israel to make a move, there are these secret talks happening in the background. Exactly. Is anyone else involved in trying to, like, steer things in the right direction? Oh, yeah, for sure. Even with all the tension we were talking about, the U.S. is still a major player. Mm -hmm. They don't want a war, and they have some influence over both sides. And then, of course, you've got the other big players in the region, Saudi Arabia, UAE. They're watching this very closely. They're worried about Iran, too, so they can make things better or a whole lot worse. So it's not just two countries having a standoff. It's like the whole world's involved. In a way, yeah. And one thing we haven't really touched on, and I think it's important, is the human cost of all this. It's easy to forget about that, right, when you're talking about, like, maps and missiles and stuff. But at the end of the day, it's people who pay the price. It's true. Whether it's a targeted strike or a full-blown war, the people who live there, they're the ones who are going to suffer. No way around it. And that's why it's so important to really understand what's happening, not just like the headlines, but the whole picture. 
because mm -hmm. whatever happens next, it's going to have a huge impact on everyone. You know, it's funny. I feel like we've been on the edge of our seats this whole time, like waiting for the other shoe to drop. You know that feeling, right? Like yeah. when they're about to announce who won and you're just like, come on, just tell us. I know exactly what you mean. The whole thing is so tense and the stakes are so high. And it's not just about what happens tomorrow or next week, right? It's mm. about how this could change everything for years to come. No crystal ball, unfortunately. But based on everything we've talked about, I mean, the, the military stuff, the diplomacy, the disagreements, are there any, like, long-term outcomes that seem more likely than others? Well, the best case scenario, probably, is that they somehow hammer out some kind of peace deal. Maybe not a perfect solution, but at least something to dial things down. Of course, that means both sides would have to give up something, and that's a big if. Okay, but let's be real. Given all the bad blood and mistrust, how likely is that to actually happen? Honestly. Not very. I mean, you look at their history, it's just years of broken promises and failed negotiations. But then again, nobody really wants a war, right? Mm -hmm. Especially not one that could spiral out of control. So a peace treaty isn't likely. What else is on the table? Well, the thing that keeps a lot of analysts up at night is this idea of like a slow burn, not an all out war, but maybe more cyber attacks, those proxy groups fighting each other, maybe even some limited strikes but nothing that it would trigger like World War III. Hmm. But that kind of thing could go on for years. Just like a constant state of tension, always on the verge of blowing up. That would be awful for the region. Absolutely. Countries like Syria, Yemen, they're trying to rebuild after years of war. This would make that impossible, not to mention all the other problems it would cause. Religious fighting, fear, uncertainty, and that stuff, it spreads. You'd feel the effects everywhere, from oil prices to terrorism. It's a lot, and none of it's good. So as we're trying to make sense of all this, what's the one thing you really want our listener to walk away with? I think the most important thing to remember is this. This isn't just some far-off conflict that doesn't affect us. This could literally change the world. The choices made in the next few days, weeks, they'll have consequences for all of us, not just in the Middle East. That's a good point. We're all connected, whether we like it or not. So as we wrap up this deep dive, I guess I'm left with this feeling of, like, we can't just ignore this. We have to pay attention, stay informed, and talk to each other about this stuff. I agree 100%. We can't just sit back and hope for the best. We all have a responsibility to learn about these issues, to question what we think we know, and to hold our leaders accountable. Because the stakes really couldn't be higher. The decisions being made right now, they could shape the world for generations. We've dug into the military options, the diplomacy, the human costs, the long-term implications. But as we finish up here, there's still that one question. What happens next? And, well, I guess we'll just have to wait and see. But one thing's for sure. The whole world will be watching.